Taste and see that God is good. In him, we need put all our trust. Amen. Please be seated. Wow, what a bunch of readings we have today. Exciting meals, things we weren't expecting, very strange commandments from our Lord. Let's dive into this meal that has been offered to us. Speaking of food, I have a friend. She is educated, experienced, and kind. She has lived outside the United States. She speaks more than one language. And she is also a follower of Jesus, like I am. She is smart. She runs a company. She accomplishes goals and manages people with aplomb and good humor. She is truly an inspiration and someone that I admire. And yet, when I consider her, I think about food. Specifically, her turkey pot pie. I was at her and her husband's house for a meal last year, and they served the most amazing turkey pot pie I have ever had. I, I still can't even talk about it. The crust was flaky and tender, just the right amount of thickness, not too thin, not too thick. The edge was just baked perfectly. The turkey was a lovely combination of white and dark meat shredded with the right amount of salt and the right amount of black pepper. And it was all in a delectable gravy. I have the highest regard for my friend. But she fed me in a way that I will never forget. And she is the source of a meal that only she can give me. And I really hope she gives it to me again someday. <laughs> so today we have a meal offered to us. From wisdom and from our Lord. Both of these meals are not necessarily what we want, certainly not what we expected, but these are meals that give us nourishment that we desperately need. Let's look at how God feeds us through wisdom and through our Lord. Let's start with wisdom in our first reading. Wow, there she is. What a stunning figure. What an amazing character. She sets out a feast alongside with mixed wine. She's killed animals, she's built a house, and she's standing at great heights yelling for us. Come, eat, drink, live. Who is she? In previous chapter, in, in the chapter eight, she offers her credentials. She says, the Lord created me at the beginning of his work, the first of his acts of long ago. Ages ago, I was set up at the first, before the beginning of the earth. When there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no springs abounding with water. In Hebrew scripture, wisdom is both created and she's a co-creator. Her personification is reminiscent of some of the goddesses of ancient Near Egypt and ancient Near East of the time. Some interpreters see her that way, others think of her as a totally independent expression of God's wisdom. Whatever categorizing she has, she is definitely part of the created order, and she has preeminence and authority. And it is from this position of authority that she often refers to us as her children 
and she calls us to follow in her ways. Becoming wise then is not a cerebral experience. She is embodied and embodiment and she wants us to eat her feast. Mm. This is wisdom. What we put in our mouths, what she gives us, she feeds us in all of our extremely hungry places. And all of us are hungry, I think. All of us are hungry for wisdom, regardless of class or education, age, or the status in our community. Wisdom surprises us. She's living and breathing. She's yelling for us. She's making noise and she's stunning us with what she offers. Not what we expected. Maybe we thought wisdom was something that we acquired through our merits. Or perhaps wisdom was merely part of the status quo. This is not what she offers us. She offers us something different. And it's interesting that this imagery in Proverbs actually perhaps could be the idea of Jesus when he was talking about himself as the bread of life. It's uncanny, don't you think? How both wisdom and Jesus want to give us real life by giving us real food but in an unexpected way. Feeding the hungry. This has been the theme of our summer. Chloe Eggstrom, now Baker, referred to this in her sermon from a few weeks ago when she talked about these being the bread Sundays of summer. We have been thoroughly entrenched in John 6. We've been reading a lot about Jesus feeding people and about him being the bread of life. We will hear yet even more of it next week. Um, when we began our bread Sundays of summer, we started in the beginning of chapter 6 where uh, Jesus was feeding the 5,000. That incredible moment where bread suddenly appeared and then more of it and more of it. This blew people's minds so much that even when Jesus tried to get away from them, they went after him. He tried to get away from them by sailing. They followed him in their boats. He went to Capernaum. They went to Capernaum. They figured out that he had slipped their grasp. And they went after him to find more bread. If you read the verses 25 through 34, I, I am not convinced that the questions there are innocent. Uh, they basically are asking him, just can you do the bread thing again? Can you just do that thing with the bread? And he says, well... I, yeah, but <laughs> he's not fooled by their questions. He says, you're looking for me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of loaves. He gets it. But even in this moment, in the, rip, in the uh, scripture that we just heard, in the gospel reading, um, when the crowd keeps looking for more signs, ergo, bread, God, in the person of Jesus, wants to lead us beyond just the basics of putting things in our mouths. He wants to ask us to go higher up and deeper in, using our humanity, our need for that sustenance, to drive us to want him in all of his fullness. This teaching was given in a synagogue in Capernaum to a bunch of people who probably knew Jesus when he was a kid. Now, you can imagine, think of somebody you've known your whole life. I can. I don't have kids, but I'm an aunt, and I have a lot of nephews and nieces, and I have a favorite niece. Her name is Sarah. She and I text each other all the time. She lives in Denver. I feel like I know this dear person. However, should Sarah ever say to me, hey, auntie, guess what? I can walk through walls. I would be scandalized. I would be angry. How come I didn't know this before? I would be aghast. 
And so we can put ourselves solidly in with the people who were stupefied by Jesus telling them that he is the bread from heaven and that he wants them to eat him. (laughs) But I'm hungry. I've got a need for something that satisfies. Where else am I going to go except to this very strange man who I thought I knew who can actually make food appear but has these bizarre things to say about consumption of him. Now, remember that this gospel was one of the very last ones to be written. It was written at the end of the first century. It's not part of the synoptics that come beforehand in the Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Each one of them has a recollection at the end of these gospels of Jesus performing that Last Supper, of that Eucharistic moment that we all share here every Sunday. There's a representation of that in each of those three, but not in John. If you get towards the end of John and you're reading about the end of Jesus' death and crucifixion and resurrection, there's no mention of the Last Supper. What we have is Jesus in an upper room having a meal with his disciples, giving many teachings, and then suddenly they're going through the Kidron Valley to the Garden of Gethsemane. So there's a strong chance that perhaps what we just read today was a way of affirming what early Christians were already doing. In the Acts of the Apostles, it says in uh, chapter 2, in verses 45 and 46, they broke bread from house to house when they were all sharing things in common. And this often and usually included a Lord's Supper. So perhaps the stunning verses that we read about reading, about uh, experiencing Jesus as food and drink was something that early Christians were already doing. And that they finally were like, oh yes, this affirms what I've been doing and how I've been feeling on the inside after we do this common meal together. Maybe that's why the language was the way it was. When we hear about Jesus' offering of himself as as food and drink, uh, we want to say, along with the disciples and those who are listening to him, This teaching is difficult. (laughs) Who can accept it? The answer? Not many. Jesus was not making himself easily accessible, easily understandable, sensible, comfortable, always wanting deeper communion with us. Jesus asks if we are willing to let him into the very fabric of who we are. This gift of spiritual food is the kindness of God to help cement our relationship with him when we get to ingest his spiritual presence at the rail. Here at St. John Baptist, let us really resonate and sink into this comfort. When Peter leaves in about seven weeks, we will be metaphorically stepping out of a very nice, quiet village into a wilderness. Let's hold on to this image of wisdom calling out to us from the heights of her home of Jesus calling into a richer, deeper life with him through participation in this amazing mystery of the sacrament of his body and blood. Both wisdom and Jesus know what we need. They want to ask us to go further, to go beyond, to go deeper, but they also know that we need comfort and sustenance together. At times during this time of transition, our feelings are going to be so strong and the strain on our sense of control will be so great it might feel like too much for us. Let's remember our trust is not in what we understand for our understanding is so limited and the scope of our seeing is so small. Our trust is in God who wants to be with us and comfort to us in body, mind, and spirit. We believe in a God who makes a way for us 
without question, even when we don't understand. And while we're standing around wondering, what do we do next? Feeds us unhesitatingly on the richness of his love and presence. Amen. Amen.